Melissa doesn't tell mine. We are we are live now. We are being recorded, and this Facebook is just they're, they're retarded, and they're just dragging their dragging their ass on this. But what I want to talk about is um, I did I did post something today about I believe. I think there's something real important about that. We uh, we we jump into to also true. A lot of people jump into whatever whatever line of spirituality they decide to jump into. And it, 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 it seems to be a prerequisite that, well, there must be some kind of qualification. And more often than not, it, 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 it evolves as an understanding of um, maybe you know more about history, or maybe you really understand of this setup, or maybe you really understand of this ancient culture, or maybe you have a clearer understanding. It, it always seems to be, instead of, I believe in it, it, seems, it turns out to be some kind of justification based on some stupid ass pill that, that we're supposed to have taken. And at some point we got to start talking about somebody says, why? Well, because I believe and it just needs to be that simple. And yet for the life of me, when I look around at much of what's being produced, I don't see the kind of thing that allows a person to say, well, you follow that because I believe in it. I mean, it just needs to be that simple. To say it with conviction and compassion, it really means something. And you can ask all kinds of other spiritualities that, and you'll get a real simple answer. And for us, it seems to be this 30-minute dissertation about why, you know. And more often than not, when you boil it down, it, it kind of comes out across as, well, I know something you don't. Therefore, I'm more justified in following this face. And that's, that's a real ego-boosting proposition that doesn't really generate the kind of uh, desire in others to want to follow this kind of pattern. If they're not seeing that kind of success in their life, they're not, they're not so anxious to say, well, maybe I'll take a look at it. Because if we think about it, we've just spent 20 minutes saying, oh, I don't know why it stopped, but I'll start it again. Is it still recording? What are you doing over there, Melissa? I don't know. Okay, so there we go. So maybe everything I said will still be on that. We'll see. Maybe I can merge it. But what it comes down to, for the last year I've talked about the ideas. And the ideas that are found in the foundation of faith are essential. We, we, we practice the, the mental gymnastics necessary to to cultivate the ideas that what we're doing might generate some kind of positive effect in our life. It's just that simple. There's a, there's a men, mental state of, there's a mental state of being that occurs with that. Or everybody always says your thoughts create your reality. Well, what kind of reality are we creating with these thoughts? Are we simply creating a larger ego to justify our ra radical divergence from societal norms? Or are we simply creating something as simple as I believe? Because there's going to be shit happen in life. And, People are going to die. People you love are going to walk away. Children are going to grow up and go out of the nest. Um, all of these life situations we have to deal with <laughs> is that educated guess that we have used as a framework to determine the quality of someone else's offspring. Is that going to be good enough to help us negotiate some of these times in our life? There is sickness. There is disease. We can be as zen as we want to, like Dan Pena says. Uh, but sometimes, but at some point, you got to pay the bills. Are we creating that idea that allows us to believe and operate in today's world? That's a real legitimate question we need to ask ourselves when we begin to discuss the qualities of this spirituality we're following. Um, and we may not always like the answer. So I want to talk about one that I've talked about before, and it's a real favorite of mine. I wrote, I wrote a book some years ago called Eager's Feast. <laughs> so I'm going to read part of it. We're going to discuss it because like I said, the last year has been talking about ideas. This year is going to be about action. What action can we take to demonstrate that this simple statement of, I believe is worth a shit because I promised you in everybody's family, if you're the only person practicing this way of life, everybody's looking at you trying to say, well, there, and as soon as you make one simple mistake and it doesn't have to be a big one, they will all stick up their noses and pass judgment with a quickness. Um, oh, well, that's kind of what you get for living that life. I mean, you ought to know better. I mean, that's just silly nonsense. Yet the, the glaring fact of the matter is that 
no matter how Christian you are, at some point in your past, in your history, in your ancestors, more of your people followed this pagan faith than they did this thing that you're following now. And for 10,000 years in Northern Europe, um, it seemed to work quite well. Kingdoms were built, magnificent empires rose and fell, um, and yet all of a sudden we can't, we're not qualified to do that anymore. Says who? So when we come up with the idea of I believe, we got to start following that up with some other stuff. The chief among that is bearing up under the load. And I know that sounds a lot like some Christian ideologies, but we got to consider that. So I began to ask myself, where does that, where does that show up in our spiritual literature? And whether you like it or not, what we have here, this is what we have. This is the framework that we have to, and, it, and I have a real feeling that it's sufficient to move us forward. Whether anybody likes it or not, whether you can find a dozen problems with it or not, whether you can say it's too heavily Christianized or not, there's a framework here that's strong enough to move us forward. And, I, and every time I hear that, all I can think of is, well, one of these came way before the other. So who made who here? The simple fact of it is when we say, I believe it's gotta mean something. And that meaning always must be backed up with action. Um, the Theodish produced some literature at a time that, that promoted the idea that we are our deeds. I happen to think we are far more than just our deeds. Um, if I was simply my deeds, I probably shouldn't be alive. It certainly shouldn't be well respected. That's just the nature of the game of life because we don't always make good decisions. And we don't offer forgiveness or communion or any of that other stuff here. You work through it. So we're a little bit more than our deeds, but there are some deeds and some actions that must back up the idea of, I believe. <laughs> the toughest place to do that is within the family. The toughest place to do that is with those people that are closest to us. And when we decide to bear up under that load that we decide to shoulder, with regards to our quality of our statement of believing. The one story that comes to mind is, is Tyr and Thor securing the mile wide kettle from Hymir. So we're gonna talk about that. It starts off real simple. Of old the gods made feast together and drink they sought, ere sated they were, twigs they shook and blood they tried, rich fare in Eager's hall they found. <coughs> if you think about it, we are all standing on the edge of a vast ocean of spirituality or whatever you want to call it. Our ability to take a plunge into that, into really being able to immerse ourselves in what it means to be completely secure in the ability to say, I believe, um, there's a certain amount of magic in that. And I know some people are going to cringe at that, but it says right there, they made feast together. That idea of being together in this is one of the things that reinforces our ability to keep moving forward. Drink they sought, twigs they shook. That's the working with the runes. That's an understanding of the path of life. If you shake the twigs, because the runes weren't written on little pretty discs back then, they were on twigs. They were on twigs of a fruit bearing tree, preferably an apple, usually written with blood or soaked with blood but then they find their rich fare in Eager's Hall. Well, that's a great ocean hall. That's not on the land. That's somewhere else. So when you think about Lagoos, you're, you're presented with the idea that everything that walks, breathes, talks, crawls, lives, is largely made up of water. So there's a flow of energy and life that permeates everything. You can see it if you look from space and you see spring come, you know, that, commit, that rises north as the frost retreats, you know, the greening of the planet. Um, you can see the, the expansion and contraction of the ice caps as if the planet itself is breathing. All of that is an aspect of water. The ice, the flow of life, all of that. This is where the gods found rich fare. We need to consider that when we start talking about, I believe. Joseph Campbell was very fond of saying that whenever a community settled into an area, they incorporated themselves into the world in which they lived. 
we live in a much different world than all of them. And how do we incorporate ourselves into that world? See, it's very difficult to rail and, and raise hell and, and complain about the machine, but we can't do shit about that. But when we sit together with each other, we might find that rich fare in Eagers Hall once we understand that all of us sitting at a table together on this path of life as outlined by the runes, now all of a sudden we mean something. And when we look at each other and say, I believe, something very special begins to happen. That's recognized in the second one. The mountain dweller set merry as boyhood, but soon like a blinded man he seemed. So he points it out right there, that all these people living on land of the mountain dweller, the mountain dweller's usually alone. Merry as boyhood he seemed, but soon like a blinded man he seemed. So he's lost his vision. He's seeing things, but there's no joy in his life. And the son of Ye gazed in his eyes, for the gods of feast shall thou forthwith get. So he understands the necessity of people sitting down together at a table, laughing and loving and taking care of each other and feasting together, enjoying a full belly and a fine, a fine mug of beer or meat or whatever it is, or Coke or tea or however you want to do it. There's something very special and essential to the development of our spirituality when we sit together and enjoy each other's company in person to give a hug, to feel that touch, to see their eyes, to read their body language. All of that means something. All of that cultivates in ourselves the reassurance that I have made a good decision. I have made a good decision to believe in this. There is a good path for me in this life. There's lots of people in this spirituality that have sat down with each other that given any other circumstance in the world, they would never associate with each other. Ex-cons and veterans, you know, some of the people from across the country come together and sit down. People from across the city come together and sit down. They're on wildly different types of people, but for some reason they believe, and in that belief they decide, I'm going to go sit down with that fellow. We're going to have a beer. We're going to get something to eat. We're going to get something to drink. We're going to have a good time, and I will be reassured that the decision I've made is the right one. They, have, they may have conquered many things in their life. They may have overcome many trials and struggles and all kinds of other things to be the quality type of man necessary to sit there. They didn't do it simply by reading about it in a book. They took action. <laughs> then the far-famed ones could find it not. Uh, the, the word wielder toil for the giant worked, and so revenge on the gods he sought. So Odin put Oheimir to work, and it kind of pissed him off. He got a case of the red ass about it, and... Um, he decided he was going to fix something. So that's like anything else. When we start putting things into action on our behalf and people don't understand it or they can't comprehend what's going on, they're going to get a case of the ass. They're going to take cheap shots. They're going to shoot one across the bow. They'll do their best to stab us in the back, especially if it threatens their ego and their ability to believe. It's always a threat that we're going to face. It's always something we're going to have to contend with. Um, he bade Sips mate the kettle break. Uh, he said, um, and so revenge on the gods he saw. People will stab you in the back if they see you indulging in this lifestyle and enjoying some kind of success. Ask me, I'll tell you all about it. He bade Sif's mate the kettle bring. Therein for ye all much ale shall I brew. The far famed ones could not find it and the holy gods could get it nowhere. So this, this means it's out of their reach. Till in truthful wise did tears speak forth and helpful counsel to Lorithi gave. So we can't lay claim to somebody else's heritage, no matter who we might be. And that really says that very clearly there. It's not our responsibility to lay claim to someone else's heritage. I don't care how divine you are. But Tear spoke up. And it took him a minute to get there to say, I, I, I may have something. There dwells to the east of El Vigar, Hymir the Wise, at the end of heaven, a kettle my father fierce doth own a mighty vessel, a mile in depth. So this is Tyr's father. This is Hymir. And he's got to go contend with that to secure his heritage. Now, when I began to read this, I, I began to delve into this after my father passed away. And it spoke to me in a lot of ways. See, 
it takes courage to face up to those things. And sometimes we're not always so good at it because it took him a minute. He's surrounded by the, some of the most powerful, successful beings in the universe. And he still took him a minute to say, well, my dad's got one. Why? Why is it so hard to say that? Is that not his heritage? Is that not what belongs to him in the future? Is that not what he's worth? He's obviously gone out and been successful enough and developed himself enough and made enough sacrifice that this group of very powerful beings said, you know what, once you come with us, you belong with us. And yet he's still got to go contend with his family. And I don't remember who said it, but it's, it was the name of a book the, talking about family, the, buy, the ties that bind and gag, because sometimes they truly do. They're very difficult to contend with. We face that a lot in, in, in these spiritualities, these pagan faiths, also true, whatever you, what have you, and that our parents may look at this and not really understand or approve when we simply say, I believe we have to take some kind of action. We have to bear up under the responsibility of demonstrating that the way we're living is yielding positive results in our life, the kind of results that would make our parents proud of us. Some parents will never be proud of us we still got to face that. We can't just sit down and cuss about it. We walk through it. We get through there and we put one foot in front of the other and we continue on. It's a very painful situation. So what does he get? He said, Thor spake, may we win, dost thou think this whirler of water? Tear spake, I friend, we can, if cunning we are. It's a real important thing in the, that little stanza right there that Thor, the warder of men, decides to assist Tyr as a friend to go secure his heritage, to help him deal with the things that have crippled him probably in life and caused him to think twice about himself, the, the disapproval of the father. Uh, there's few things that cause more damage in a child's life, especially a girl's, if the father doesn't understand the relationship he's cultivating with the children he is raising. Mothers are going to be the other part of it. So when the divine, the, the very warder of men, the defender of Asgard, Thor, the most powerful of them all, says, I got you, buddy. Let's go get it. That means something. So Tears decided to make action, take action to support, help, to encourage, to benefit his tribe, his community. He's not going to do it alone. I wonder sometimes if we say, I believe, if we have truly in our minds the ideas that we're not alone in this. That's something very important to consider. Now, I'm not talking about the Holy Ghost coming down and laying hands on and speaking in tongues and all that horse shit. I'm talking about the idea that these divine beings are literally a part of who we are. That's our ancestry. And within that ancestry, within that blood, we can create a thought process. We can dig deep. We can pick ourselves up by the bootstraps and get on. That's something real important to consider that all too often when things get tough, we want to give a gift for a gift to help us make it through. When we've already got everything we need to step up to the plate and become what we're supposed to become. And it sucks. It's painful. But shit, if it's worth having in this life, it's worth a little struggle, isn't it? This is a part of that. Forward that day with speed they fared. So they didn't dick around. They got on it. From Asgard they came to Eagle's home. The ghost with horns bedecked he guarded. Then they sped to the hall where Hymer dwelt. The youth found his grandam that greatly he loathed. And full 900 heads she had. But the other fair with gold came forth. And the bright-browed one brought beer to her son. So... That 900-headed giantess that greatly he loathed, I wonder how many of us have parents that have passed on or grandparents that have passed on that we know they didn't like us. Because that's a real representation of that right there. A full 900 head she had that greatly he loathed. Well, that's a real difficult thing to reconcile with an for people, isn't it? when these people pass on and leave these scars within us, how do we deal with that? How do we begin to make that connection with the Desir and our ancestors that help us understand that 
part of what we're doing here is to break that cycle that caused us to have so much them to have so much pain and discontent and literally spread it throughout the fucking family. And part of our responsibility when we say, I believe is to take the action to stand up and break that cycle. It ain't easy, but remember he got some pretty good backup. <laughs> He's also got someone there very special. He's got his mother there. Most parents, one or the other, are going to be proud of the things their children do. So she is the bright browed one and beer brought to her, brought beer to her son. Now that's typically what you see the lady with the mead cup, the honored guest gets the first drink. That's just, that's Balder sitting in the high seat in Helheim. That's Odin sitting there when, when uh, Gunlaug brings him the drink. That's any number of scenarios throughout the lore, it was even in Beowulf, the lady with the mead cup, Sigrith and um, Sigrith and Sigurdrifa, or Brunhilda, she gives him the memory draught. This presentation of a drink is a reminder of his own greatness. You see it with Kali and Shiva. When Shiva, when Kali copulates with Shiva, she's the one that reminds him of his divinity. She is the pure, primal, savage. Um, sexuality of nature, the, the violence of it all, the, the, the power of it all. She reminds Shiva of the God that he is. That's a recurring theme in pagan beliefs throughout the world, literally. And, the, and we, we have a real hard time with that. And then we get confused in today's world when, when men seek women to tell them that they're man enough. Masculinity is conferred on masculinity, but these divine gifts, these gentle reminders, these powerful understandings, they come from the feminine, the divine feminine. It's like I was telling a friend the other day, most men, they don't know what to do. Somebody's going to be sitting there eating chow. He's not going to get upset and defend the home until she says, hey, get upset and defend the home. You know, that's just men are that way. We're built that way. We're built for the fight. The understanding of the subtle natures of many things escape us. And that complimenting competing aspect of the divine feminine reminds us that's worth getting upset about that's not go give it a hell sit down we always want to be manly men doing manly things but there's a real understanding that goes with that almost yin and yang kind of idea the bright browed one brought beer to her son so there's a world of understanding in that simple line we might want to pay attention to. She's healing that resentment he has towards the rest of the Desir in that one little action. Kinsmen of giants beneath the kettle will I set ye both, ye heroes bold. For many a time, my dear loved mate, to guest is wrathful and grim of mind. So he's a dickhead. He violates the very first thing of, you know, he's not going to be hospitable. He's going to come home from work and he's going to be, he's going to be a jerk. And I've seen that, you know, dad comes home and all the kids got to be quiet and go to your rooms and play and be quiet. Dad's tired. He's, you know, you get your butt whipped. You might get beat or something else or go outside and play, whatever. Just leave him alone. Cause it's been a hard day at work and I deserve to sit down and have a beer. That's the kind of guy he is. Nobody likes those kinds of guys, but sometimes there were generations that just stuck it out. They may not be very happy, but they'll stick together because, well, that's what we know. And we'll, you know, um, it made sure what it did was make sure that a lot of us grew up with a lot of scars from nonsense. We didn't need to grow up with. We're all sitting here breaking that cycle. You understand that, right? This is our action breaking that kind of cycle. When we look at our children, the one thing we remember today, that's our future. I'm all they have. And it escapes this guy right here. So right off the bat, we understand we're dealing with an individual that hasn't taken into consideration what his responsibilities are. People like that are angry. Somewhere deep inside them, there must be an understanding of failure. And yet, the bright browed one did not bring him a beer. There's no cinchy is up, get me a sandwich. There was none of that. She took the guests and hid them because she understood what's going on here. Lay to his home, the misshapen Hymer, misshapen. The giant harsh from his hunting came. The icicles rattled as he came in for the fellow's chin for forest frozen was. So he's cold. 
that frigid aspect of ESA that covers, that, that solidifies everything. There might be something running underneath, but it's a real cold, solid kind of thing. It's really hard to deal with. It's hard to give an icicle a hug. But there he is, large and in charge. Hail to thee, Heimer, good thoughts mayst thou have. So right there, she's prepping him. Listen here, buddy, you know, pay attention here. Have some good thoughts. Here has thy son to thine hall now come. So this is his son. They're reminding, this is our boy, you know. For him have we waited, his way was long. So she knows and understands the journey her son has taken to begin to deal with some of the things that we all have to contend with growing up in the manners we grew up in, the situations we found ourselves facing, the, the pain that we had to deal with in some aspects. Some of our parents set that example. Might not have been both of them, might just have been one of them, but somebody set that example, or we might be the ones setting that example. Reminding those, have those good thoughts. Here thy son has come to thy hall. So she knows what he's been doing, how he's been successful, how he has been adopted into this tribe of very powerful beings. For him have we waited, his way was long. It's never an easy path. It's never an easy path to contend with some of the things, the baggage that we got to deal with. And sometimes that means taking action. That means sitting, it might be something as simple as writing it down, right? Write it down. Right, absolutely write down the resentment that you have. Write down the things that caused you pain. Write down those things that make you angry. Write, write, write it down. Just take a simple action of putting it on paper. Look at it. Look at it. Let it look you in the face. Let's see what's really got, what's got under your skin. And then burn that shit. Get rid of it. Because at some point, if we're going to be recognized as the son that has traveled the long way, and not taking the shortcut and adopted the same mentalities, albeit with a new name, but taking the long way and try to deal with these things, we gotta face that. We gotta take the action of dealing with it. We can write a book report on all of what these $5 words mean, but if we haven't dealt with it, it's gonna come back at some point and eat our lunch. And with him fares the foeman of froth. So she warns him, look here, he's not alone. He's got some good people on his side. And they're the kind of good people you don't want to fool with. Now, right there, any arrogant man, his ego is immediately going to be challenged. Because when a man creates an idea about himself and hasn't done anything to justify this large, that larger than life perception of who he is, well, any successful individual is automatically a threat to that. Anytime somebody sees someone actually by the sweat of their brow and the strength of their hands build themselves into something, the individual that has not done that, well, his ego is going to be threatened. Even though he has the possibility, the potential to do the same thing, if he sat down behind the computer and typed out some words or written a book or slandered somebody else to build the perception of who he is, he's going to be threatened by a successful individual. And right now, this is already happening in his mind. The friend of mankind, that's Thor. It's very important to consider the friend of mankind. And if you are, they call him. See where under the gable they sit, behind the beam do they hide themselves. Now the beam at the glance of the giant broke and the mighty pillar fell in, in pieces. So he's giving them, you know, go to hell looks. And he's got a little something behind his go to hell looks. Eight fell from the ledge and one alone, the hard hammered kettle of all was whole. Forth came they then with his foes he sought, the giant old and held with his eyes. So he thinks he's going to be able to bluff his way in this. That's his son. I brought you into this world. I'll take you out and make another one just like it. It's probably running through his mind, you know, but the order of men is there. Uh, and that's not so easy to contend with. Why can't we have that same kind of bravery when we look at the things we got to contend with? Where's that within us? We can all be strong as oxes. We can all be young and powerful and vital. When we say, I believe, what action have we taken to reassure ourselves that we got that same kind of thing on our side?
You're right. I very much am dealing with aspects of faith here. Some people ain't going to like it. I really don't care. Forth came they then, and his foes he saw, the giant old and held with his eyes. Much sorrow his heart foretold when he saw the giantess's foemen on forth, come forth on the floor. Then of the steers did they bring in three, their flesh to boil did the giant bid. So for all his bluff and bravado, it's like the guy that walks into work on Monday morning. He's angry. I dang it, he doesn't want to be there, and he's angry about it, and he's mad, and traffic sucks, and he might be two or three minutes late, but he's so angry you don't want to ask him about it. My gosh, he's angry. Well, he might be angry, but he's probably about 4,000% less effective in a fight than he thinks he is. And this is exactly what happened here. You know, he walked over there like John Wayne, and you know who he met? Clint Eastwood. He sucked. He just, he screwed. So he, now all of a sudden, he's going to change his tune and start, oh, buddy, old pal, old friend of mine. But it's still under his skin that he's been, his bluff got called. See, he kind of figured he could handle Tyr. But you can't handle Thor. You you can't handle a man who has the conviction of his faith when he says, I believe. Something we might want to consider. So he brings in now all of a sudden the rules of hospitality become important. Whereas before he's throwing shit around, breaking stuff. <clears throat> when you confront your parents about these kinds of things, it may be a bit much to expect a favorable response. More often than not, you're placing a threat on the ego of someone. Well, I did the best I could. And that's true. They probably did the very best they could. And we all need to understand that. But when we want to take that real strong action of sitting down and saying, hey, I want to talk to you about this, because this really hurt me. That takes courage. That's where courage and honesty come in. That's the kind of action I'm talking about. That's the kind of action that reaffirms, I believe. My head was each the shorter hoots. So they cut off their heads, and the beast of the fire straight they bore. The husband of Sif, heir to sleep, he went alone to auction of Hymir's egg. So Thor just, you know, kind of rubbed it in his face and ate two ox. He said, you know what? You want to be a dick? I'll show you. Come on. <laughs> he ate two of them. To the comrade of Hori hung, hung, hung near, then did Florithi's meal full mighty seem. Next time at eve we three must eat the food we have, the hunting spoil. So now there's a real thing going on here. And you'll see it between fathers and sons. And sometimes you'll see it between mothers and daughters, though I'm not so much an expert on that. But between fathers and sons, there's a competition. Who can do better? And the guys that can no longer do it, you'll hear them talk the most about, well, it's like talking about high school football. Dude's 50 years old, still talking about how that touchdown he run when he was in high school. Dude, that's 30, 40 years of time where you ain't done nothing else? What, are you kidding me? You want to sit here and talk about, well, we're going to go hunt tomorrow, and I'm going to show you what it's really like. And if you, my gosh, you're not going to eat all my food. And There's a real – it's a real challenge to, to go up to your parents and, and deal with this stuff because their egos are still doing the thing. They're, those thoughts are running through their mind. They ain't forgot that shit. And here we have – Tyr really trying to secure his family's heritage with that mile-wide cauldron. Now, that's been a symbol of Hymir's strength and authority for a long time. It's just like a guy that has a Corvette, or he's got a collection of guns, or he has the best plow horse, or he has the best house, or the best job, or the biggest paycheck. That's his identity. That's what he is. So the son comes along and says, this is mine, I'm taking it. He's really telling him, you're not really worth that. I have taken the long path, and now I'm here to lay claim to my heritage. If you think about it, when you threaten those kinds of things that become a man's identity, you're really challenging the ego of that individual you're really facing down those thoughts that we think we are. How do you fight that? How do you, how do you, how do you contend with a person's ego? Cause you can't win against that shit. You will never be right. We might take all kinds of action and confront our parents about all kinds of things. We might deal with the issues of family at every level. We know how we might take the long road, but they're going to hold in their mind an idea about themselves. 
to go in there and challenge that. You know, sometimes the brave will, will hang out where the fools rush in. We have to really consider that. What good are we really doing by seeking to point this out? So let's consider that maybe we shouldn't point it out because we're not fighting. We don't really literally have Thor on our side, but we have traveled a long path and hopefully we've earned a little bit of wisdom. Sometimes it's more important to take that high ground and say, you know what? I understand you did the best you could and I love you for it. See there, you're not challenging the ego. Now you're breaking a barrier, a defensive wall, because even a dog, when it shits in the floor, knows it's done something wrong, right? You walk out of the room with his tail between his legs. So we go through life and we understand these things we screw up. And sometimes they run through our heads all day long and we can't get rid of them. It's an automatic thought process of everything we've done wrong and it keeps going through. And our minds, our bodies don't know that what our minds are thinking aren't, isn't really happening. And it floods our bodies with those chemicals and sickness has emerged from this and old age emerges from this and damage to everything about us emerges from this incessant train of thought of something we may have done wrong. So what happens when you don't challenge the ego and simply come from a place of understanding and wisdom and love? Well, now all of a sudden that great challenge that we were facing isn't that great of a challenge anymore. See, that's where healing and growth begin to occur. And if we have an unresolved issue, maybe we don't need to run in there and say, hey, dickhead, you're an ass for doing this to me and raising me this way and I resent you and I've hated you and my life has sucked because of this and this is all your fault. Well, no, it ain't all their fault. See, we're, we're, we're dealing with all of that stuff. Maybe we should go in there and say, hey, I've had a tough time with a lot of this stuff. I understand you did the best you could and I thank you for loving me the best you could. There's no challenge to the ego and you neatly hurdle those barriers to that person's ability to defend themselves. You break down that wall. There's some important real life lessons of taking that action of taking that long road in dealing with sometimes the pain that we have. But we get gratified because karma's going to get his ass. <laughs> so we don't ever see Tyr say any of that. We get a hint of it when the bright browed one reminds him that he's traveled the long road and gives him a drink of beer. But we have the order of men. We have this idea of, of, of a powerful spiritual force. Um, he's going to break down that wall for him. He's going to pave the way for that to occur. So you have this very powerful spiritual will, if you will, this, this very force of will, the thought, the power of our own spirituality against the ego of an individual that's very, his, his very life is, is satisfied committing, causing pain. So this spiritual will begins to break down those barriers and he has no defense against it. Just like going with the high ground of talking with a, an, an idea of understanding and love for the things that have happened in the past, there's no defense against that. It takes a lot of damn courage to do it. Not everybody has it. So this powerful spiritual will, as epitomized by Thor, is going to break down the ego of this individual very completely. <laughs> so... Now they're going to go hunting. Well, he's going to show him, right? So he's still very much hanging on to this idea. I don't want these people in my house. I don't want to be faced with my failures or my disappointments. Why in the fuck are they here? Blah, blah, blah. Well, I'll just show them we'll go hunting. So fain to row on the sea was viewer. He said, if the giant bold would give him bait, I am respect. Go to the herd if thou hast it in mind, thou slayer of giants, thy bait to seek. For there soon mayest thou find me, thinks bait from the auction, easy to get. Swift to the wood, the hero went till before him an ox, all black he found. From the beast, the slayer of giants broke the fortress high of his double horn. So he cut off his head. That's a fancy way to say it. Cut off his head. He went and got some bait. Heimer spake, thy works, methinks, are worse by far. Thou steerer of ships, than when thou, than when thou, damn it, than when still thou sittest. 
So he's challenging me. So you still ain't got it. Yeah, you got some bait, but you don't know how to run this ship, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So there's an insulting. There's always this kind of give and take heckling between men in these, in these competitions that, that um, they're always very insulting words. And if you were to say to anybody on the street, you'd probably get, you'd probably get hit. You'd be in some kind of tussle. But when you work with people, you get this kind of good natured humor that's really laced with this poisonous idea. Um, they're going to belittle the other guy. They're going to talk about his mother or his sister. They're going to say these ugly things. And some people just won't put up with it. Some people will. Some people will get right back in there. and Oh, it's just in fun. Um, I don't think that it is. I think it's a corrosive element against any kind of, any kind of ability to build a team. When people are making those kind of shitty comments to each other, um, it never comes out right. It never comes out well. And take that for what it is. The Lord of the Goats bade the eight begotten further to steer the steed of the rollers, but the giant said that his will forsooth. Longer to row was little enough. Two whales on his hook did the mighty Hymer soon pull up on a single cast. In the stern, the kinsman of Odin sat, and Vera with cunning his cast prepared. So Thor's challenging. Look, go out further. Let's get, let's get on it. Let's get in it to win it. Hymer's like, no, this is good enough. I got two whales. The warder of men, the worm's destroyer, fixed on his hook the head of the ox. There gaped at the bait, the foe of the gods, the girdler of all the earth beneath. The venomous serpent swiftly up to the boat did Thor, the bold one, pull with his hammer the loathly hill of the hair of the brother of Fenrir he smoked from above. The monsters roared and the rocks resounded and all the earth was so old was shaken. Then sank the fish in the sea forthwith. So it doesn't say it real clear here, but basically what happens is Thor, old boy pulled up two uh, whales and uh, Thor pulled up the Midgard serpent and um, started to kill it. Would have done us all a lot of good. But when the egotistical father that has lived his life being the angry man at work and, you know, being the braggart and the one that knows everything, the the damn know-it-all and the topper, the guy that's got one more better comment than you, and he's a little bit better than you, and he's done this in the past, and he did this in the past. When he gets faced up with the idea of that dude really can do it, he cuts the line. He doesn't want to face that. So when you get that kind of stab to the ego, there's the only thing you can do is just shut up. Joyless back they rode was the giant. Speechless was Heimer sit at the oars. With the rudder, he saw a second wind. He just got faced up. And that's a hard thing for a man that ever has never gone out and really proven himself or taken the action to prove who he is when he gets faced up by somebody that can, that somebody has put in the effort to win. If there's somebody has put in the effort to be successful. Somebody has put in the effort to do something other than be the dickhead that runs the house. Slap his old lady around a little bit kind of be that guy, you know, be that kind of guy, because that's what this guy is. And the powerful spiritual will that was assisting Tyr to secure his family's heritage just put him in his place. We all kind of long for that. We all kind of long for that justification. Many altitudes live that life of expected phenomena, waiting for that sign, waiting for that sign of to tell us we're on the right path. Oh, I saw a raven, or I saw a deer, or I saw this, or I saw that, or I pulled a rune, or I pulled a card. We're always looking for that kind of justification to find that. And yet right here, we're being told that once Tyr took the action to secure his heritage and take care of these things that had held him back, that he took the long road and developed the friendship with the powerful spiritual will, that stuff was put in its place simply because he said, I believe. And I think that's available to us too. I think that's a part of what we're all doing here, what we're all trying to figure out. The way to say, I believe and understand that we got something on our side other people don't understand yet, but they will. It's coming, I promise you. The half of the toil wilt thou have with me, and now make fast our go to the flood. Our home wilt thou bear the whales to the house across the gorge of the wooded glen. Florithy stood, and the stem he gripped, and the seahorse with water awash he lifted, oars and baler and all he bore, with the surf swine home to the giant's house. So one more time, he shows him up. These are things that each individual task, Jaime would think would be a, a well, it's going to be hard work. Thor takes care of all of it. 
But once again, the powerful spiritual will has what it takes to handle those hard tasks of decent, good work that other men shy away from. That's important for us when we talk about taking action. Do more than the guy next to you because you can. His might, the giant again would match for stubborn he was with the strength of Thor. So this guy's ego, he's not going to give up. He's going to continue to make himself look like a fool. None truly strong, thou stoutly he rode, would he call, save one who would break the cup. Lorithi then, when the cup he held, struck with glass the pillars of stone, as he set the post in pieces he shattered, yet to glass, I mere behold, they brought. But, but loved one fair of the giant found a counsel true and told her thought. Smite the skull of Hymir, heavy with food, for harder it is than ever glass was. So he's still trying to make a cheap trick look like it's something impressive. But that lady, that divine feminine that provides that support and encouragement for the men to develop that idea of masculinity, not to gift it to them, not to give it to them, but to support them in the cultivation of it, tells him, Hit that dumb ass in the head. The goat's mighty ruler then rose on his knee and with all of his strength of a god he struck. Whole was the fellow's helmet stem, but shattered the wine cup round it was. Fair is the treasure that from me is gone, since now the cup on my knees lies shattered. So spake a giant, no more can I say. In days to be thou art brewed my nail. Enough shall it be if out you can bring forth from our house the kettle here, tear then twice to move it try but before him the kettle twice stood fast. Jaime knows his son ain't got what it takes by himself, but he ain't by himself, is he? And neither are we. The father of Mothi, the, the rim seized firm, and before it stood on the floor below. Up on his head, Sif's husband raised it, and about his heels the handles clattered. He got it. He got it. We can't always take care of these things that we have to deal with our family by ourselves, can we? I mean, good night. If we had the right instructions to handle it to begin with, it wouldn't be the problem that it might be in our lives today. If we knew how to handle it to begin with, we wouldn't be sitting here discussing this shit. Somebody wouldn't be hearing this that needs to hear it. But we have to have that help. And who knows what it might come as. Somebody might say something. Somebody might read something. Somebody might see something. There are all kinds of actions to be taken that will unveil the ideas of the right course of action to handle these things that sometimes hold us back from becoming what we're supposed to become. We can know all kinds of things. But until we take that action, and Odin's continual sacrifice is an action, we may not ever uncover what it means to really be the kind of, to indulge in the kind of joy that sparks creativity we may never have dreamed existed. We've got the pain part down real damn good. I don't know about you, but I've spent a lot of money covering that shit up. A lot of money. Got me in a lot of damn trouble too. What else are you supposed to do? Huh? We ain't got no instruction book. And yet here in this thousand, in this, it was committed to paper a thousand years ago on a much older oral tradition. Our gods have thrown us this lifeline saying, pay attention, boys, pay attention, girls. There's something good here. <laughs> he stood and cast the kettle. He stood and cast from his back the kettle and Mjolnir, the lover of murder, he wielded. <laughs> so all the whales of the waste he slew. Not long had they fared ere, ere one ere ere one there lay of Florithi's goats half dead on the ground. In his leg, the pole horse was laying, the, de the deed evil Loki had done. That take, that's probably a interpolation from another poem where he got somebody to break his leg and eat meat, suck the marrow. Once again, the ego convinces someone that you're worth it. Go ahead and break that leg and suck the marrow. Aren't you worth it? Shouldn't you get it? Well, you ain't never done nothing to earn it, even though you were told not to. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. That kid paid for that. That's another story altogether. But the mighty one came to the council of gods and the kettle he had that Hymers was. So gladly their ale the gods could drink in Eager's, Eager's Hall at the autumn time. That's the path of life that we all face. 
we're going to have to contend at some point with our families, with the decisions we've made, with the pain we've caused. And it ain't always the easiest thing to do. I don't think any of us are innocent from, from the damage we cause to each other. I think if we try, I think if we pay attention, I think if we figure out how to do this and understand that when I say I believe, it means I've taken some actions to cultivate the strength of my convictions. There's some real neat stuff because right there that they sat down that so gladly their ale the gods could drink. That allows us to create within our minds a thought process, a feasting area, if you will, in a brain that's made of 70% water where all of the positive attributes that these gods represent might sit down in our thought process and feast and allow us to create for ourselves that good life, minus the baggage that we have been carrying around for so long. So there's some real wisdom in these words, and there's some real beauty and some freedom in these words. And I think every one of us that pay attention to them, these are the kind of things we've been looking for. And we cultivate that by action. We cultivate that by getting up and facing those things and saying, I can't avoid it anymore. There's no reason to avoid it anymore. I want something better out of life. I want more. I want that kind of positive purpose, guides, and direction that these tales helped men thousands of years ago build kingdoms and empires by their own hands. So let's get on it. This next year is going to be about action, folks, and it's going to be about these kind of actions. And I'm going to say lots of broad statements that paint a brush stroke across humanity. Um, if some of them you can use, use them. Some of them you can't, don't. But we live in a time right now that's so radically different than what we're used to. The, the riots in the street have been replaced by the the simple sinister comments about people wearing masks on social media. And it's eating people's lunch. It is diverting us from this path that we are finally finding a firm footing upon to move forward in the world. And I don't care where you've come from. I don't care what your background is. I don't care what evil thing you might have done. I don't care what you punish yourself for daily. Right there, we've got an understanding that if I take a little bit of action in conjunction with the idea that I believe that powerful spiritual will will be there to help us. Take it for what it's worth. And I'm done talking. Thanks everybody for joining me. If anybody got any questions, you want to discuss it? Thank you, Brian. Thank you. So I got a question. Thank you. I have an answer. Okay, so we just talked about all of that stuff and then taking action. So of everything we talked about, what do you think, what would be a good action to focus on? Uh, person, see if you can light a fart. Ha! <laughs> 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 <Hey>, tube. <laughs> I can't. No, I don't know. No, man. That's up to each. That's up to each individual, man. I mean, no, no. everybody's got their own thing they got to deal with, man. But try so. I mean, write it down. That's like I said at the beginning. Write that shit down. Write. Take take a little inventory of yourself, man. Get rid of some of that garbage. The whole. Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. If that doesn't help you get rid of it, go find some help. Go find some help. Go sit on a couch somewhere. That's what you want to do. But that's that's what we we got to take that action. And sometimes it requires changes in diet. Sometimes quit being a drunk. Sometimes stop smoking so much weed. Sometimes you know get off the cocaine. You know stay off the yay. You know, there's, you know, we, 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 we get in here, a lot of people get in here and all of a sudden in this wild, radical, powerfully liberating spirituality, now we have a justification to continue acting an ass. We just take the stuff that brought us to the crossroads to force us to change the foundation of our spirituality. Now we have new names for all of it. We can keep on going. No, you can't. Sometimes it means growing up. Sometimes it means becoming something more. It means, you know what? Uh, you know, sometimes it's time to stop doing that. 
that's, that's part of what it is, is be on it. That honesty and courage are at the front of the list for a damn reason. And sometimes it means, you know, I don't need to, I don't need to hate that person anymore. You know, they're just a big asshole as they were. And sometimes you got to realize that. Take that action to say and to, to stop it. You got to grow up. Dude, like, I'm out. Forget it. <laughs> I know, right? We'll see. <laughs> Don't worry, man. I ain't going to stop saying you dirty jokes. <laughs> I was waiting on that. <laughs> the guy who just said to light your farts on fire. fire. <laughs> or send them in a bank tube. I did that and told <laughs> Jeff I was a superhero. <laughs> that was 20 years ago, too. So what was your superhero name with that? I don't know, man. I don't know, but <laughs> I was, that was like My nipples were pierced at the time, too. And he's like, Daddy, what are those? I'm like, I got the king of Europe gave me those for killing dragons. He believed it for years, too. Oh, my God. I love it. I was a little bit wild before. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't because everything was going hunky dory. I promise. <laughs> I have no room to talk. <laughs> I don't think any, none of us do. You know, none of us do. That's the beauty of it, man. We've all done something gloriously stupid in our lives. Oh man, daily. Like <laughs> still. Did you not get my picture of the bank tooth this morning? <laughs> <laughs> and yet here we are all talking about maybe. Maybe I can find something to believe in this. And that is fucking awesome, guys. That's the neat stuff. That's the real, that's the real where you win on things, man. That's really where it's at. And then you take a little bit of action, you see that it works out. Hey, I believe a little bit stronger. What I mean, when you cultivate that kind of stuff, what can stop you? You gotta ask yourself that. Once you begin to cultivate that framework of a thought process that is outlined by these positive ideologies represented by these gods. And they feast at a table of your thought process. You, there's nothing that stops you. But all it takes is one negative thought. That's the whole lesson of Loki at Eager's Feast. One negative thought will fuck up the entire dinner. And so we, we got to take action to get rid of that. They bound him to a rock and hung a viper over his head. And, you know, since he wouldn't give up on it, the, his girlfriend had to suffer too. So that's... That's another tale. Well, and the longer you go with, um, you know, training your mind to kind of rise above and rise to that occasion, it's like you, you, you start to just rewire yourself entirely so that those, those, it, that one negative thought comes fewer and fewer times, you know, and, and you start to become like almost like a, a self-fulfilling prophecy in the best possible way. That's absolutely correct. Jordan Peterson has a doctor. Jordan Peterson has a video out. He talks about the uh, writing down goals and how essential it is writing these things down. Um, because as you write them down, your brain begins to rewire itself literally to become more cognizant, more aware of the opportunities that might be associated with the success of that goal. Whereas without that definitive set of purpose or goals, you're really kind of coasting. You're really not aware of that kind of stuff. And for those people that are very purpose driven in life, it's essential to put that stuff on paper. So you'll see it. And once you see it and can't deny it, excuse me, because that's sometimes what we kind of do is we, we get these thoughts in our head and we, we have a real, we, over years, we begin to cultivate a real fancy way to, you know, kind of denigrate that. Well, make it not so painful. Make it not so truthful. Well, that really wasn't what it was. Blah, 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 blah. Write it down. Let it look you in the face and get rid of it. And there's this, because there's, everything about the lore is like an onion. Blaine Qualls told me this. It's like an onion. You peel off a layer, you peel off a layer, you peel off a layer, you peel off a layer. And it's true. When you peel an onion, you cry. It's quite likely when you begin to peel this onion in your own life, you're going to cry. You're going to feel it. You may not bawl, but you might, you might get, you might find yourself crippled, but you have something now to stand up with. And always, when people find themselves at that point. I always suggest, you know, envision yourself down on one knee. Now, now, envision yourself standing up, 
larger than life and shrugging your shoulders and letting those things fall away. There's a real freedom in that. And it might take many years to try to, to cultivate that, to feel that. Some people have, a, have an enormous amount of emotional baggage that is almost, so for some people, it's, it's overwhelming to even begin to try to figure out how to handle men and women, particularly women. It's, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's an enormous amount of emotional baggage that, that stifles our ability to be free. And one of the things about this lifeline that's being thrown to us is a, is a recognition and a reminder that we have what it takes to get rid of it, that we'll be okay without it. It doesn't have to be our image. And sometimes that's, that's exactly what happens is that people begin to cultivate the identity of the victim, that this was done wrong to me. I'm, you, you need to pay attention to me and listen to what I say because I'm a victim. This has happened to me and my words might have more weight. It's a real weird, even Julian the apostate or the pointed that out in his book and in Miss Paganon, I believe the beard is what that means or against the Galilean perhaps it was. He talked about, look at the hero of the war coming back and the attention he gets and yet the sickly person, uh, look at how much attention they get for doing nothing. And you can see it on social media all the time. It's the same concept at play. Nothing's changed. Nobody has created any new emotions in the last 15,000 years. We all feel the same thing. We love, we hate, we, we have compassion, we have mercy, we have pity, we have, we have anger, we have all of these things. It's still the same thing. There might be 10,000 different variations of the combination of the two, but they're still the same across the board. Um, which ones do you want to embrace the most? Which ones do you want the most active in your life? Take that action and get rid of some of those thoughts that run through your mind and say, you really fucked that up, buddy. Okay, how do I get rid of that? You know, so that's what we got to do. Well, Brian, yeah. um, I noticed, like, I've, I've talked to you before about my past and some of the issues I had. Yeah. And what I found is that it was like every morning I got a blank canvas to be anybody to paint myself as anyone. Right. And every morning I got up and drew the exact same ugly pictures, the exact same scars, the exact same sins down on that same blank canvas every day. And one day I just kind of had to make a decision to repaint that canvas completely different than I had before. And it, it kind of gets to a point where you just have to wake up and go, you know what, uh, before I can convince anyone else I've changed, I'm, I'm going to have to convince myself I can change. That's that the part I can be different. Off the most. I can't sit here and say this shit if I don't try to change. I wish, wish I could. But, but I got to tell you, that is an amazingly brave thing to do. Because when we continually redraw that picture of who we are, what do we, because we don't have an image of what we look like if we change that. We don't know what happens if I let go of this. What will I be? Who will I become? Will I be as important? Will I be as pretty? Will I be as valuable? If I don't have these things that have caused me to redraw that same picture. So what you're talking about is really and truly a real brave act. And that's the important part. You're talking about a brave act. Act and, and I applaud you for that. Not a lot of people will never figure that out. They never do. And sometimes, and it's real nice to be able to draw that image and be able to laugh about it <laughs> because I, I look at this image I drew of myself and that's a character. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, it gets rude and it gets real hurtful after a while and, and you redraw that character and it is like a little like stepping off a cliff. Um, because a lot of times when you paint that new picture, the old people aren't in it. And that's the scariest part. That's true. That's true too. Once anyone begins to change or improve themselves, um, people that can't relate to you with the same old uh, framework that they have always related to you with, uh, they, they become resentful, they become hateful, and they fall away. And sometimes not so quietly and sometimes not so easily. If you continue to grow and they stay in the same stagnant thought process, yeah, sometimes it's, it's a real concern. You'll find yourself alone. 
and it's a it's a scary thing to walk that path alone. It's also a very brave thing to walk that path alone and still come out on top. It's been my experience though that for every person who doesn't grow with me but outgrows me, I've just made room for you know the next amazing person who is going to grow with me, you know, to I to walk know. my life. You know, every every one of you guys sitting here on this uh, on this call right now, you know, you I, I I had to you know personally let go of of my own you know past toxic relationships, and then it was like the moment I did that, you all entered my life. You know, so Tanner, I can totally uh, relate to that. You know, um, instead of being afraid of walking alone, be thankful that you've made it as far as you have. And be thankful that, you know, now you've got all this room for all of these amazing other people to cheer you on and walk right next to you, you know? That's true. And I, you know, I think there's a real responsibility for the other people that interact to, to be those that are worthy of that association. I think that's a, that's sometimes, I don't always want to live up to that, but it's the, it's the reality of what it is. You know, we have an obligation to, to live up to that responsibility of being um, worthy of that association for somebody that shows up here. I think that's a real, that's something I really need to talk about with regards to people that show up in, in Ossetru and, and they get bamboozled by people that aren't willing to live up to that responsibility. I mean, even just the idea of hospitality, you have an obligation as a guest to act in a certain manner as the host has the obligation to act in a certain manner. It's the same way with these relationships we cultivate in this, in this spirituality we've all kind of found that has become all of a sudden so very important in our lives. Um, not, and some of us are not really sure why, but we're still trying to do it. We're still trying to move forward and these people show up in our lives and they mean something and they walk with us for a little while and then some mean a whole lot more than others. And it's real interesting when you begin to look at it from that perspective. Um, I also think it's a very beautiful obligation, a very, a very wonderful load to bear up under, to live up to that responsibility, to, to be um, that important example for someone in someone's life when they're in that kind of situation that's, that might be very painful. That's, that's, a, that's a very unique thing. I think it's a wonderful opportunity each one of us get to be, uh, to be that someone in somebody's life. That's I can't think of anything more beautiful than that. Sometimes it just is our children. Sometimes it happens. It gets to be lots of people. Um, sometimes it's just, it's just a special relationship. That's, uh, that's something that is uh, something I never really thought I could do to be quite honest until I got into this. Something I never thought really worthy is that we all have our frameworks of how we navigate these relationships to adopt that kind of responsibility and the importance of it in someone else's life with, with established boundaries, of course, and other things, it means something very, very special. That is an action that builds the community. That's the action that people require to understand that the decision they made to deviate from the societal norm is worth it. That's why everybody feels so good when they leave a meetup. When they leave the, when the get togethers are over, everybody feels good because yeah, man, those are good people. So glad I found them. Well, that means I got to live a little bit better. That means there's no bluff and bravado that'll pass in that shit. If you're not living up to the standard, it'll come to light pretty soon. And there are certain situations in certain areas, and, you know, if it comes to light real quick, you'll get, <laughs> you get your ass whipped. You know what I mean? It's just the way it is. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a very good point. It's a real good point. And such is the dedication of Thor in this tale. Such is the dedication of the cultivation of the spiritual will as Thor standing and calls him friend. He says, I friend, we'll get it. That means something. <laughs> I don't know what we'll all get out of this, but we're right now, everybody feels pretty damn good, don't they? We just spent an hour sitting here talking and all of a sudden, hey, you know what? Maybe there is something to this. <sighs> Fuck, man, what better thing could you come up with in the world than to finally sit down and realize, I am on something. I do have good people in my life. 
I do have those kind of individuals that support me in my endeavors and I live up to the obligations they expect of me. It wasn't always me, man. I'm just telling you right now, that was not always me. What kind of son of a bitch teaches his kid a lot of fart? Well, that's you know. <laughs> that one. <laughs> Anything else? Anybody else got something we'll talk about? We had some real good points come out of this, man. I appreciate the feedback, guys. No. Hey, do you have COVID? <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow's Monday, guys. Go out there and grab his ass. All right? And don't forget to believe a little bit. Y'all have a good night. Thank you all for joining. I appreciate all of it. Thanks, Brian. Have a good night. Thank Thanks, you, Brian. Brian. You too, Ash. Thanks, Brian.